Hello everyone, thank you for coming. Um, my name is Anatole Levin, I am director of the Eurasia program at the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft. Uh, and for those of you who don't know the Quincy, we are a Washington-based think tank dedicated to the promotion of restraint uh, in US foreign and security policy and peace and cooperation in international affairs. And uh, our underlying philosophy is opposed to the pursuit of US global primacy by military means. Uh, I'm very happy today to uh, introduce this panel on uh, a matter of vital importance for the world in general, climate change, uh, and of uh, especial importance to certain countries around the world that are most particularly endangered by the effects of, of climate change for local geographical, water, um, and social and economic reasons. Uh, I will now hand over to my colleague, Adam Weinstein, uh, to introduce the panel. Uh, thank you, Anatole. And um, for the listeners, I'd also like to uh, recommend Anatole's book, uh, which he published in 2020 called Climate Change and the Nation State, the Case for Nationalism in a Warming World. And he actually highlights the, the threat of climate change to Pakistan in particular in that book. So you should check it out. Um, and now to introduce our uh, two esteemed guests. Um, first, I'd like to introduce uh, Mr. Ambassador Masood Khan. Um, he's currently Pakistan's ambassador to the United States. Uh, previously, he was the president of Azad Jammu and Kashmir. Uh, he has also served as ambassador to China as spokesman of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and as the permanent representative to the UN, among other diplomatic posts. Uh, we are also joined uh, by Mr. Steve Reneski. He is the director for USAID's Office of Climate and Sustainable Growth in the US Embassy in Islamabad. He's held other various roles within the agency, including division chief for the Office for Civilian Military Cooperation, deputy director at the Office of Economic Growth, and a position uh, in the U.S. Embassy in, in Kabul, among, uh, among other roles. Um, and before we begin, I'd also like to take a moment to uh, express my sympathy and condolences uh, to the people of Pakistan uh, for the horrific attack that occurred at a mosque in uh, Peshawar near the police lines area by uh, terrorists who, who know no limits of evilness. Um, and, and especially to offer my condolences to the family uh, of those police officers uh, and other worshipers who, who were killed. Uh, but that is a conversation for another day. So today we are going to talk about climate change. Uh, and I'd like to begin uh, with you, Ambassador. Uh, if you could just give us a, a readout of what the current state of the situation is in Pakistan a couple months after these floods. Well, of course, uh, the intense fury of the floods has passed. But, uh, uh, but before I go make my remarks, I, I must thank you for taking this initiative. I thank Mr. Anatole Levin for his introductory remarks, your initiative, and uh, uh, drawing our attention to this very, very pressing issue once again. And I want to thank you for your message of condolence to the people of Pakistan and to the victims uh, of this dastardly terrorist attack. So thank you so much. Um, again, going back to my to your question, I would say that uh, um, uh, waters have receded, but not from all places. There are some um, parts of uh, our cropland and many other parts of the territory which are still underwater. Uh, but uh, the main problem is that uh, we have still internal displacement. People are living in temporary shelters. And uh, we, we have this huge task of uh, uh, rebuilding our destroyed infrastructure in these affected areas. And uh, there are many other related issues like uh, uh, waterborne disease, or we have uh, educational infrastructure that has collapsed. And uh, uh, we have myriad challenges because uh, uh, at the peak of the floods, one third of the country was underwater. Uh, the size of Switzerland itself, as I'm aware, Geneva Conference was held on a resilient Pakistan. 
So uh, I think that the situation is still dire and we're living with the consequences of these epic floods last year. I, I was lucky enough to visit SWAT uh, in summer when I was in Pakistan last time. And uh, I, I remember after the floods, I saw a video from one of the hill stations, Bahrain village uh, in the SWAT Valley, and everything was destroyed. It, it looked as if the SWAT river was quite literally flowing through the town. And I couldn't help but think to myself, every shopkeeper I had had met, every every everyone working at every daba I had eaten at, everyone I saw living there were now homeless and are, are probably still homeless. So the scale is is just immense. What do you think are the top priorities for Pakistan in the next year? Well, the top priorities are uh, recovery, rehabilitation, and reconstruction. And uh, let me tell you that uh, uh, within these three clusters, our priorities are that we have to restore uh, lives and livelihoods. Then the second priority is that we have to create new economic opportunities for people because lots of people have lost their jobs or their homes or their, uh, in certain cases, villages and townships. Then uh, the third is that we have to adopt a policy which includes everybody. They're, they're a policy pursued on the basis of social protection and social inclusion. And the fourth priority is infrastructure development because um, our critical infrastructure in all these areas was uh, badly damaged or just uh, disabled completely. Uh, so the maximum costs would be incurred on rebuilding infrastructure. Uh, while we do that, we would also focus on macroeconomic stability of Pakistan because these two things, reconstruction and uh, revitalization of our economy, they must move in tandem. Uh, thank you for that, Ambassador. Uh, Mr. Rineski, uh I'm going to ask what might be a, a dumb question, and I think I know the answer, but I, wanna, I want you know, more perspective for the viewers. Why should Americans care about this climate crisis in Pakistan? The images are terrible. The human effects are horrible. Any, uh, any person with a heart, of course, is going to care. But, but Americans have many problems. Why should the United States focus on this climate crisis half a world away? First of all, thank you for the question. And also thank you for uh, convening this uh, very important conversation, Quincy Institute, I really thank you. Also, my warm regards to you, Ambassador Khan, for being here with me today, this is an honor. Um, and, and to get to the, your question, Adam, um, really, you know, climate change is one of the biggest transnational challenges of our time. And the effects of climate are felt really by everyone um, in the world. And, you know, the investments and sacrifices that are needed to address climate change are shared by both Pakistanis and Americans. And so, you know, this is a common theme that we see. Um, you know, for example, we just launched a uh, US, I'm uh, sorry, a California Punjab um, state partnership and state of California is experiencing its own climate uh, impacts as well as, you know, uh, some of the provinces here in Pakistan. So, so this kind of building bonds between the two countries and, co and building communities around um, how, to, how to tackle a crisis as it happens prepare for the next one. And then also, as Ambassador said, rebuild, um, you know, rebuilding lives and livelihoods. It's very important. And I think most US citizens can uh, identify with that, you know, those who are especially living in sort of climate affected zones in the country. Um, you know, and also the other thing that's really important to keep in mind is that, you know, as recent history has taught us, things that happen in one part of the world can affect us in the United States. And so, you know, things that have happened here uh, in the past, you know, when you have uh, instability brought on by either man-made or natural disasters, uh, the ramifications and ripples can go uh, all the way down to the local level in the U.S. And so that can be in the form of refugees, that could be in the form of um, insecurity. And so, you know, really, if you look at our, our national security interests and also economic interests, we need to, to look at uh, Pakistan and the things that are happening here uh, and take a serious um, uh, look at them and also try to find a way to help as best we can from where we are. And by my count, the United States has uh, offered more than $200 million in aid thus far 
directly related to the floods. Uh, can you give us an idea of how is that aid distributed? What kind of projects does it go to? Who does USAID partner with in Pakistan? How does that work? That's a great question. Um, you know, there was of that large commitment that was made, uh, USAID is part of the uh, solution. We're not uh, responsible for all of the US government assistance that's coming to Pakistan, but we are responsible for a large portion of it. Uh, where is it going and who are we working with? We, um, by and large, uh, are, are working at first with the re actual response to the disaster and trying to bring relief to those that were most affected um, by that. But now at this stage, we are moving towards, I would say, as Ambassador Khan mentioned, lives and livelihood, li livelihoods and, and being able to recover from the disaster. So. Recovery looks like uh, resilience. So resilience meaning we're, we're trying to put our um, re relief efforts towards rebuilding better and thinking about the climate uh, when we do rebuild and uh, help rebuild. We're not doing all the rebuilding, but we're working with other partners to do so. And we're working with, particularly with non-governmental organizations, uh, UN partners uh, in, in places um, affected by the disaster to build uh, you know, at, with adaptation in mind. So building uh, higher up off of the floodplain, um, providing agricultural inputs, which are resilient to both drought and flood. Now we've experienced flood. We also are thinking about drought because it's also something that affects Pakistan. And so um, that's one example. But to, to put another, to put a finer point on it, um, Ambassador Khan's uh, counterpart here is uh, US Ambassador Donald Blum. Ambassador Blom has launched the um, uh, US-Pakistani Green Alliance last year. And that Green Alliance is a framework for deeper levels of bilateral cooperation between our two countries. Um, and that cooperation is to mobilize scientific expertise, for example, uh, private sector innovation, community leadership, government support, and higher education brain power to identify the most acute challenges that are facing Pakistan. And so, that's another form of how we are responding to the disaster and what we think we can do to help bring the whole US government here to, uh, to raise the standards of uh, any future um, disaster that, that befalls here. Uh, Ambassador, I wanna go back to you for a moment because uh, Mr. Rineski talked about adaptation, talked about rebuilding with climate change in mind. Are there any lessons to be learned from 2010 and the response to the floods back in 2010 that are now being applied to, to the present? In fact, uh, after 2010 floods and earlier, after the earthquake in 2005, uh, we started building our response mechanism, preparedness and response mechanism. And uh, uh, we had put in place an apparatus to fight disasters. Uh, we were prepared for disasters, but not uh, on a scale like the last floods. So that's why this is one lesson that we learned that uh, Pakistan was prone to natural disasters and we must have a national plan. Um, second was that these two are different floods. I mean, or the 2010 floods were devastating, but the scale was different. I mean, this time, um, I think that the, the, these kinds of floods would uh, happen once in 100 years. And so that's why we call them biblical floods because they were downpours um, and they would stop at all. I mean, there were a number of uh, factors. For instance, uh, these floods were caused by uh, forest fires, heat waves, glacial melt, depressions in the Arabian Sea, they all culminated in these downpours, torrential downpours. Uh, so, uh, and the amount of water that was there was completely different because there was this uh, lake on the Indus River, which was 100 kilometers long and 10 kilometers wide. And this was spotted by European Space Agency, or uh, there was another lake, freshwater lake, which swelled from 35 kilometers to 35 square kilometers to 350 square kilometers. So this is the second thing is that we have learned um, that we are so prone to, so vulnerable to extreme weather patterns and climate change. So this climate vulnerability 
of Pakistan has been established by these devastating floods. And uh, therefore, we, we look towards the international community for climate justice, in addition to the support that is being given for reconstruction rehabilitation. And that's why COP27 took this decision of uh, starting a loss and damage fund. Uh, we hope that it will be financed by the developed countries and countries like Pakistan would uh, would would be saved from such an annihilation in future. So I think that uh, we there are many lessons that have been learned. I mean, not specifically after 2010 floods, but after these uh, 2022 floods, um, they were discussed all around the world. And uh, as Mr. Reniski mentioned, that every country is vulnerable. Like the United States, there were hurricanes and droughts in Brazil or in China, or there were the worst heat waves in the whole of Europe. So I would say that um, there are many lessons that have been learned and Pakistan can't do it alone. Uh, that's why we need the international community's support and we're grateful to the support that has been given by the United States, not just $200 million that they have contributed, but also they've used their convening power to persuade other partners like the World Bank or ADB or other friendly countries like France and Germany and Japan to support Pakistan and be grateful for that. And I would also like to add that right now, USAID, State Department and uh, Pakistan, the coordinating uh, to, to, to uh, develop projects that would benefit people directly and that would uh, uh, launch a new program for both adaptation and mitigation. Uh, thank you for that, Ambassador. And uh, you know, if I could answer my own question uh, that I had asked Mr. Reneski, which is why should Americans care? You know, in my perception, it's because Pakistan is experiencing something that we all may experience someday. And Pakistan is quite literally on the front line of climate change. But it's a snapshot, a snapshot into our future, our collective future on and this planet. So. To me, climate change, uh, climate justice, uh, it means that that we're in this together and we can't uh, allow those countries that are most affected to to deal with this completely on their own. But I do have a, a question for you, Ambassador, because at that conference that was held in Geneva, of course, billions of dollars were pledged. But do you have any concerns that that money might not actually arrive? Uh, do you think there's going to be follow through from the international community? Well, uh, realistically speaking, all these pledges which are made at the international conferences do not mature uh, very easily or quick, very quickly. But at the same time, uh, most of the pledges have been made by multilateral institutions, multilateral banks, for instance. And uh, uh, they have repurposed their earlier programs. So uh, at least 90% of this money would go to projects. And as we prepare these project proposals, they can be utilized. And they're good because they would alleviate poverty, they would build infrastructure, they would uh, create new education, health structures, and so on. So um, I remain optimistic that if we show competence, uh, we can utilize all these funds. Um, we would also uh, uh, appreciate, I mean, in, in addition to um, sort of uh, implementing these projects, that there is a monitoring and evaluation mechanism as well. And this would be done by all these institutions who would be lending money. Uh, we, because this, these are not grants, these are not grants that, that would be used by the government of Pakistan. So that's why I remain hopeful that this, these projects would remain on the agenda of these international financial institutions, as well as the respective governments. So, uh, so that we can implement them expeditiously. Uh, thank you for that answer, Ambassador. Um, Mr. Reneski, I think there's a commonly held belief, uh, perhaps outside of government, and it may be incorrect, but I think there's a commonly held belief that USAID prefers to not engage in infrastructure, or perhaps more broadly, the United States doesn't like to invest in infrastructure from an aid perspective. Uh, do you think that's changing in light of climate change? Well, Adam, you're very astute because that is something that um, we discuss frequently. You know, the should should we be um, 
uh, our foreign assistance include infrastructure? And, you know, frankly, it has, right? Uh, going back to the Cold War period. If you look at our investments in Pakistan in the 1950s, 60s, you're looking at some of the largest uh, infrastructure, we would call hydropower plants uh, that were part of these massive reservoirs and dams, um, you know, and, and all the ancillary irrigation systems that came or sprung from those investments. And they're still operating today and some of them have been affected by the floods. You know, the irrigation networks were uh, torn up in certain areas, especially in the northern part of the country. And it's quite costly to try and rebuild these systems. Um, but, uh, you know, dollars aside, I think, uh, you know, it's safe to say that we believe in the human power and capacity building is a, a, a way that we can leverage all resources on the ground uh, in, a, in a particular country. So in the case of Pakistan, you know, partnering with the government of Pakistan uh, nationally uh, down to the you know, lo local municipalities, working with um, non-governmental non organizations, both at the UN level down to um, small locally um, operated NGOs to uh, kind of come up with a creative um, consortium kind of approach to try to solve these problems and try to rebuild infrastructure. Um, looking to build new projects uh, at a massive scale is not something the United States is going likely to do anytime soon, um, but we, we are uh, going to try and uh, mobilize our uh, resources towards the human development and capacity to address these kinds of challenges. And you mentioned NGOs. What do you think the role is of local NGOs, international NGOs, and perhaps even the private sector in this in this in this process? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, we can't we can't. Uh, I think what we, we'd like to do is be able to help bring the local NGOs and international NGOs closer together and try to create a more seamless communication and coordination. Um, relationship with them, which we are doing. And that also, as you mentioned, private sector, pri we are absolutely um, forward leaning on any private sector engagement opportunities that we can find. Uh, for example, we have recently conducted a, uh, at least two large um, diaspora, US Pakistani diaspora investment conferences here to try to mobilize um, upwards of $75 million worth of investment from Pakistanis residing in the United States that want to help. And that's not just uh, relief efforts, but also uh, investing in the, in the livelihood componentry, which is entrepreneurship and trying to help um, small agricultural businesses, for example, try to, try to get them back on their feet and get back in business in these <coughs> communities that have been affected by the, uh, by the disaster. Um, and Ambassador, uh, um, Mr. Rineski just talked about agriculture. So I, I want to ask you about the to, the potential food crisis that could result from these floods, uh, which is of course also exacerbated by the war in Ukraine and the inflation that has occurred in Pakistan's econ economy and the devaluation of, of of the Pakistani rupee. It, it it does seem like a perfect storm. Th does this concern you? Yes, it does. Sir. I mean, we were directly affected by the Ukraine war, and it led to the shortages or wheat uh, and fertilizer that we used to import from Ukraine. So that was a direct impact of the war. Uh, since then, I mean, we were scrambling to get things right, but then came the floods and the situation was worsened. Uh, <clears throat> agriculture is important for Pakistan, for food security, but it's also important for uh, uh, exports. We used to export grains and other uh, agricultural stuff uh, worth uh, 4.4 billion dollars so that that's also a loss because there's, there's been a setback i would say responding to your earlier question wh where the united states can help us and whether or not it can help us with infrastructure development i think that um, it can help us with the transformation to renewables uh, wind and solar power for instance and uh, dfc development finance corporation uh, which is an arm of the U.S. government. It is already active in this field in Pakistan. They have uh, contributed to solar and wind power in Pakistan. Uh, this is important for, for adaptation. Uh, this is important for embracing new technologies, which would help us uh, build a resilient Pakistan and build our resilience to respond better to future disasters. Now, the model can be 
there can be three categories. I mean, I would say that one can be public-private partnership, which can be supported by the United States. There could be private sector, only private sector-led projects. And the third is uh, civil society-led or supported projects. And they should focus mainly on social protection. And, uh, Mr. Rineski had also talked about navigating, you know, working all the way down to the municipal level. So, Ambassador, maybe you could explain to the viewers, uh, in in terms of this relief, what 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 responsibilities are that of the federal government? What responsibilities of the, are that of the provincial governments? How do the the provinces and the federal government work together in this relief effort? And and how can the international community navigate that? Well, I think that the federal government's uh, main responsibility is coordination, and the bulk of the work would be done by three provinces, which is Sindh, Balochistan, and Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, which were hardest hit. And uh, uh, their governments are responsive to different challenges, and they are ready to absorb whatever help comes to them. And uh, they have to kickstart these projects, because as I mentioned, that uh, hundreds of thousands of people are still in temporary shelters. And uh, so, and uh, uh, they, they would, they, they, there is, I think, uh, a fair distribution of power between the Federation and the provinces, and they can collaborate. I don't foresee any administrative glitches, but uh, every reconstruction process is a new process, and it requires uh, a new set of uh, uh, rules and regulations and also. Uh, operational mechanism. So I hope that we would be able to develop it fast. We're already working on it uh, back home and um, uh, we, we, we can put our act together. Thank you for that, Ambassador. And uh, uh, Mr. Rineski, I want to ask you a similar question uh, from, from the U.S. government perspective. How do you navigate this, this federal and provincial system in which you have to work with many different stakeholders? Yeah, it's um, it, it's something that um, you know. It when we work with our implementing partners, for example, um, which we have many, um, it's something that requires high level coordination. It, it's uh, it's it's discussed at the very highest levels before uh, we even design our programs, and then get to the point of where we actually um, would implement programs throughout the country. So we can take into consideration uh, the navigation, shall we say, of um, working at the federal level, that's really government to government. But then when it gets down to the local or provincial, down to municipal, it's really working through our implementing partners, which are NGOs, uh, but also um, if we do uh, partner with the private sector that we would um, use our convening power to try and help bridge, bridge you know, private and public uh, in those cases. So it's just a question of planning and operationalizing our planning and then, uh, you know, as Ambassador mentioned, monitoring, evaluation, and learning all the way through so we can keep on improving uh, in the future. Uh, and if I could ask a follow-up, because, uh, of course, the United States is, is one of Pakistan's closest partners, and, and uh, but Pakistan also has other partners, including China, and China has pledged aid as well, and China has an interest in, in green technology as well. So is, is this something where there's any potential for coordination between China and the United States, or are these very much parallel efforts towards the same goal, but not any, not, not, not any coordination beyond that? Uh, at this stage, it's uh, very much parallel. Um, you know, we find that we are, um, um, we have plenty of work on our hands. Um, we have partners that we are working cooperatively with right now. And, uh, if, you know, other um, countries in the region are here to help, then it's, uh, we, we would definitely support that. Um, uh, Ambassador, uh, I'd like to ask you a question related to something uh, uh, Mr. Rineski had said in his previous uh, answer, and you, you as well raised this, the, this notion of monitoring and evaluation. Uh, and of course, I think uh, we all know that there's critics uh, of the Pakistani state uh, or of the provincial governments or of particular political parties. And these, these criti this criticism, you know, tends to go something like, okay, all of this aid is going to flood into Pakistan, uh, but 
it's it's going to be mismanaged. It's going to be misused. Money is fungible. Perhaps the aid will be used for flood, flood reliefs and or perhaps it won't. Uh, what do you say to these concerns that frankly come from within Pakistan and also from outside Pakistan? It depends on what uh, money we are talking about. If we are uh, talking about money that is tied with certain projects supported by, let's say, the World Bank or the ADB, it is their responsible to monitor how that money is used. And the government would uh, collaborate. If there are pure grants which have been handed over to the government of Pakistan, uh, we would even then uh, welcome any support, uh, any monitoring mechanism. So I think in any uh, post-disaster situation, when humanitarian assistance is funneled to a particular community, there are these charges of corruption. But uh, uh, I think that the government of Pakistan and all the institution, provincial institutions included, they are committed to transparency and accountability. Uh, because uh, we, we do not want to give this impression to the international community that somehow this uh, uh, this this aid coming or this assistance coming to, for flood relief, flood response and reconstruction is not being properly used. So I think that these, there are ways of, if we have learned lessons from the past, we must have learned some lessons to evaluate and monitor how these funds are used. And uh, we would be glad to work with the international community and the donors who made these pledges to us. Uh, thank you for that answer. And uh, uh, Mr. Rineski, how does USAID monitor its own uh, aid uh, and, and the way it's actually used? Because, of course, USAID has also been criticized in the past of, of inefficiencies, fair or not fair. Uh, mm -hmm. how, how, how does USAID ensure that it's, 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 it's uh, spending the American taxpayers' dollars in a responsible way? So, you know, USAID and, and you know, other U.S. government um, foreign assistance providers, um, we all adhere to very strict um, in, in, you know, guidance rules and regulations brought by the, um, our respective uh, inspector generals. And so the IG at the end of the day sets the tone for how we are going to um, uh, allocate um, and then monitor and then see how, how things are going. Any, any kind of impropriety is, we have ele an electronic system for that. We have a paper-based system. We have a word of mouth system. There are many ways for people to report impropriety. Um, we are always, uh, as a learning organization, trying to figure out new ways to be able to identify areas where we think that our money's not being spent uh, the way that we, it was, what was intended. And so I can just, you know, assure folks here that, you know, we've learned a lot in some of the large scale um, uh, investments we've made in the region in uh, Afghanistan, Iraq, other places. Uh, we bring that to bear here in Pakistan in the current situation and, and in future situations. Uh, uh, thank you for that. Um, Ambassador, I want to zoom out a, a bit and ask a bigger question. Uh, because when these floods hit Pakistan, and I was looking at the scale of this damage, uh, I, I couldn't help but think, you know, this damage is 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 well beyond what any terrorist outfit could ever dream to 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 accomplish. And for two decades, uh, in many ways, the U.S.-Pakistan relationship was narrowly focused on the war on terror, uh, and 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 huge sums of money. Uh, went into combating that threat. And of course, it's a real threat, as we were reminded uh, yesterday. Uh, and yet, I can't help but wonder, in some way, ha ha has the occurrence of these biblical floods, as you called them, Ambassador, uh, put put into perspective U.S.-Pakistan relations? Perhaps it, is it a wake-up call that there are other issues, there are bigger issues, and that U.S.-Pakistan relations should be broader than they have been in the past if we're going to deal with what Prime Minister um, uh, Sharif called uh, the, the problems of the 21st century. Well, I think that the United States-Pakistan relationship is important. It has been important and strategic for the past 75 years. We have fought wars together and we have made peace together. Uh, so we have part, we have been partners in peace and war. What I want to say here is that uh, uh, countering terrorism is a priority. 
because it's a potent threat. It's an existential threat and uh, it hasn't disappeared as was evident from the uh, horrific attack that took place yesterday. So this is one thing we must realize. The second is that uh, Pakistan and the United States, um, after the withdrawal of US and NATO troops from Afghanistan, has to recalibrate their relationship. And uh, while uh, these subjects like strategic stability or stabilization of Afghanistan or counterterrorism would be important, we would also be devoting a lot of time to uh, uh, green technologies, agriculture, cooperation in green energy. Uh, we would be talking about trade and investment. There's huge potential uh, for that. And uh, earlier you had asked a question, uh, why should the United States care? And we have, one, we have been strategic partners for a very long time. The United States is looking for allies all over the world in the emerging global scenario. Pakistan has been a steadfast ally. And uh, if uh, this kind of flooding happens in Pakistan frequently and Pakistan's infrastructure is not built um, on solid foundations, there would be volatility and instability and that would hurt United States interests as well. I mean, in addition to the common humanitarian humanitarianism that we invoke in such situations. If I could go a little back you would, about the question of uh, monitoring and evaluation, I would say some of the organizations have their own monitoring mechanisms, for instance, WFP or UNICEF or UNDP or uh, WHO. They, and the key would be, I think that this time, the key would be that we go to the grassroots communities uh, and, uh, and there should be local and uh, municipal and provincial uh, monitoring mechanisms as well. Uh, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a difficult challenge, but I think that uh, we should continue to monitor this proper utilization of this funding that comes. And if I could ask you to delve a little uh, uh, more into one of the points you made, which is that the this climate crisis and this flooding could drive insecurity in Pakistan. Um, what do you mean by that? How do you think that that would play out and how can that be averted? Um, you see, when we would talk about, I mean, every the entire world is talking about uh, um, climate change and the threat that it poses to both developed and developing countries. The entire planet is vulnerable. Uh, climate scientists established uh, in case of Pakistan that this was uh, um, climate induced uh, disaster that occurred in Pakistan. And uh, there's this uh, uh, organization based in uh, United Kingdom, it is called World Weather Attribution. And they established that at least uh, 50% of what happened there could be attributed to climate directly to uh, extreme weather patterns. So if that's the case, th there are two immediate corollaries. One is, of course, that uh, uh, the world has to take responsibility. It's not just one country. Today it is Pakistan. Tomorrow there would be another country in South Asia or any other part of the world, Latin America, Africa. Uh, small island uh, states. Uh, so, it, uh, and the United States being a superpower, leader of uh, the present world order, it must take responsibility. And uh, so the other thing is that it, the it threatens imperial security itself. I mean, these uh, floods like these or other extreme weather event events, they disrupt A, security, B, economies. Uh, and uh, uh, as we have seen, I mean, the planet is so interconnected. Uh, all the uh, countries of the world are so inter uh, interconnected that what is happening in Ukraine is not confined to, uh, you can't sub sub uh, circumscribe it just to Europe. It, it has uh, sent shock waves around the world. So if something worse happens in Pakistan, God forbid, it would affect South Asia, uh, the entire neighborhood and the world at large. 
Uh, thank you for that answer, Ambassador, and I hope I hope the world is paying attention uh, to to that. Um, uh, I just want to remind the viewers who are registered uh, and who are actually in Zoom, you can submit your own questions via the Q and A pane uh, panel if you if, if you have questions and. Uh, if they're good questions, I'll try to uh, raise them in the last uh, 15 minutes or so that we have. Uh, but Mr. Rineski, this next question is for you. And I'm going to uh, uh, shamelessly uh, pitch a uh, podcast that Quincy Institute did with uh, Tabadlab, which is a, a think tank and advisory firm based in uh, Islamabad, in which we interviewed former U.S. and Pakistani diplomats about the relationship. In fact, we even looked at the 2010 floods. But one pattern that I've noticed uh, with U.S. diplomats who have previously served in Pakistan uh, is that they say that the relationship should be more broad and it should focus on uh, things other than the security angle. And we should talk about investment and we should talk about infrastructure. And I hope it's OK to say uh, there's, there's, it's always quite interesting to talk to U.S. diplomats after they've served versus while they're serving, because I think they can be more frank. That's probably true for all diplomats. But do you think uh, within the context of USAID, is there this, uh, is there any kind of conversation or transitioning ha hap happening in which uh, USAID is focused on some of these broader issues, especially now that the war in Afghanistan, at least the US role in that war ha has come to an end? So, you know, it's a good question. You know, USAID, um, what they consider a development diplomat. Uh, so international development is my, my, my field. Um, I, but we, we all within our, um, within the embassy here in Pakistan, um, we were all, uh, we've all read the national, our U.S. national uh, security strategy. We all understand, um, you know, the importance of Pakistan in that strategy. This is a highly strategic, geopolitical, um, uh, challenging area of the world. Um, and also adding to that challenge, we have the climate uh, impacts as well. And so, you know, really for us to um, maintain our, uh, our moral imperative to help those in need and our economic interests, uh, Pakistan is a vibrant country with, an incredibly, with incredible opportunities economically to trade with the United States. There's amazing, I would say, underdeveloped opportunities to invest in Pakistan that we need to, we're trying to in our uh, economic growth and climate and sustainable growth, I should say, office, we're trying to, to um, identify those opportunities and come up with programming to help harness uh, what we can from them for public and private benefit. Um, and then there's also the security aspect that you mentioned. You know, our, our Pakistan's prosperity uh, and, and peace in Pakistan is also reflects on the United States writ large. We, we benefit from a stable Pakistan. And so our work here at USAID um, is to help make Pakistan a success as much as we possibly can uh, in order to um, create conditions for a long-term peace and prosperity uh, between our countries and in the region. And so, um, you know, I just, a couple of things I want to highlight just to, to put something to that, those words, is that, um, you know, we, we really are trying to effectively manage Pakistan's water, agriculture, and energy resources, um, because we know those are really crucial to the country's growth and development. And so we're trying to be more focused on strategic um, opportunities uh, in, in those, those areas. So obviously water, agriculture, and energy are part of the Green Alliance I mentioned at the top of the conversation. What are we doing? We actually have a couple of um, activities uh, in the works right now that are, that are in design that we hope to be able to put out um, and, 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 and tender for uh, organizations to compete for, which would be around um, what we're calling climate smart agriculture which is trying to come up with ways, mostly locally driven innovations to help solve some of these um, agricultural sustainability issues, including uh, reducing carbon uh, emissions. So mitigating um, you know, methane at the uh, uh, dairy farm, for example, um, supply chains, green shipping uh, is another area that we're interested in. Like how do you reduce the, the um, emissions from the whole supply chain and trade? 
and also looking at investment opportunities in light of the current economic situation. How do we make Pakistan or help Pakistan be an, a, an a interesting investment target for US investors? And so I mentioned earlier as well, the diaspora are critical to that conversation. Um, and, and I would be remiss to talk, I didn't talk about our um, interest in, in water management and particularly storage, uh, water storage. So um, the, the traditional water storage here in Pakistan used to be the um, uh, snow uh, and glacier um, caps in the mountains here, the beautiful tall Himalayan mountains. But now with climate change, we're seeing that water running off into the Arabian Sea. How can we get that water captured and stored for um, energy, for livelihoods, and for, um, and, and for life itself? Those all sound like incredibly interesting projects and uh, projects that will that will actually improve people's lives. So it's it's great to hear that they're being pursued. You did mention the economic situation, and we do have a viewer question, which is that, as has been alluded throughout this this panel, Pakistan is undergoing a, a severe economic crisis, and it simply doesn't have the money available in this moment to sort out infrastructure development. Uh, as you know, so far as addressing climate change. So without significant international aid, you know, can Pakistan sort this out? And how confident are you that the aid is going to come through? I don't just mean from the United States, but I mean from the international community. I'm supposed to respond to that question. Uh, that was actually for, for Mr. Rineski, but uh, okay. you know, it's, I, it would be appropriate for both of you. So if you, yeah. if you have some thoughts, Ambassador, um, that was my fault for not specifying. But if you have some thoughts, please share them. Oh, Your Excellency, Rineski, if you I, want to go for it, yeah, please do. No. Well, what I want to say is that it is um, primarily national responsibility. I mean, if the world doesn't help us, we would uh, mobilize all national resources to respond to this challenge. And we have to invest in uh, resilient infrastructure. Uh, however, uh, I mean, these pledges have been made. I mean, as Prime Minister of Pakistan said that uh, the pledges that were made on January the 9th in Geneva exceeded our expectations. We, we had said that, uh, you know, our immediate need was $16.3 billion. And uh, we, we had, uh, uh, hoped for $8 billion in pledges, but uh, uh, we got nearly $10 billion or $9.7 to $10 billion uh, worth of pledges. So this is, this is great. The international co community responded generously. Your question is that if we don't have that money, that's a bit of a, a, a hypothetical, but I would say that if we don't have that kind of money, will we manage we will manage it with difficulty I and mean, we'll probably have to use all our wherewithal and ingenuity to develop this kind of infrastructure. But uh, Pakistan is not an island. I mean, we have uh, uh, relations with China, United States, the international financial institutions, other friendly countries. And uh, uh, what was mentioned earlier, that Pakistan should not be seen as a country which only needs to be helped. It is a country which has uh, a lot of promise uh, growing. Uh, I mean, there's another story. I mean, there's, there's this uh, story which covers floods and devastation and uh, destruction. But there's another story. We have uh, uh, growing middle class uh, estimated to be between 80 to 100 million. We also have uh, 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 youths uh, most of it is being educated. I mean, uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of graduates are coming out of the universities. They're joining Pakistani market and they are being absorbed by the international markets. So, and this youth dividend uh, uh, and this youth bulge that we have uh, and the uh, other cohorts that you had, demographic cohorts, uh, they should make Pakistan an attractive destination for investment for the United States, for other countries as well. It's, now, this is not something futuristic. This is happening already. I, Mr. Reninsky referred to the diaspora community here uh, in the United States. They are investing heavily in Pakistan, and there are about 80 American enterprises 
uh, already investing in Pakistan. Some of them are conglomerates. And uh, uh, they're supporting about 1 million households and they employ directly 150,000 people. So <clears throat> uh, it's not that Pakistan uh, has become totally dysfunctional because of these floods. Um, we're confident, we have uh, uh, resilience, we've dem demonstrated resilience in the past and we'll make it. Uh, I, I, um, rest assured we'll make it. It's a, it's a nation that has uh, uh, faced many storms and survived, and we would continue to survive and hopefully thrive in the near future. Uh, thank you for that, Ambassador. And of course, Pakistan is incredibly resilient, and I'm always moved by the, uh, the, the charitable nature of Pakistanis to their, to their fellow Pakistanis in crisis. Um, uh, that is something that, uh, that I think everyone who goes to Pakistan notices, and I think it's a real strength of Pakistan. And on the subject of investment and economic development and uh, youth, I, right now, I think Pakistan is the, the fifth most populous uh, country in the world. It's projected to potentially be the third most populous country in the world by, by 2050. It does have a middle class. It does have um, some incredible... Uh, uh, you know, universities. In fact, it's 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 not uncommon for the the Pakistani American diaspora to attend medical school in Pakistan and then come back and work here. And Pakistani doctors who have who have uh, gone to medical schools in Pakistan often come here for residency and 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 are very successful. Uh, there is venture venture capital that's interested in Pakistan. The diaspora is certainly interested. Um, it, it, it has incredible potential in textile and in, 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 um, in the textile industry and tech uh, and so forth. And sometimes I make the joke that I've even gambled my own uh, professional career on the potential of Pakistan by by focusing on Pakistan. So I really do believe in Pakistan and in the U.S. Pakistan partnership. Uh, and we also have strong people to people ties. Uh, I, I believe that the United that the Pakistan produces the most. Fulbright students to the United States of any other country. It, it's well over a hundred every year, and some of them stay. Uh, some of them go on to do great things back in Pakistan, uh, which I think is the point of the program. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Uh, Raneski, how do you see uh, the future of the U.S.-Pakistan relationship vis-a-vis -vis economic development and uh, helping uh, Pakistan uh, live up to its potential? Well, that's a fine question, and it's one that um, you know me. I often think about. I ponder, <laughs> ponder before I got here, and I ponder it while I'm here. Um, and we do more than ponder. You know, one of the things um, that really stood out to me, and has still, still is something that captures my imagination, and, and kind of reflecting on the positivity from the ambassador's words, is that the youth, uh, the future of this country is vibrant. It's I, I've never seen. So, so many um, talented and hardworking optimists in a, in, in a place where many people see negativity. I mean, we talk about the climate and, and that kind of thing. The youth here, um, what, I've, what I've seen is if you have, you know, if you have the English language, you have a, a good internet connection, you have some skills that are uh, portable via the internet, for example. Uh, one of the biggest uh, growing markets here is this freelance economy. And so people, young people are not waiting for policies to change and people to, to give money if they can, they want to earn it. And so one of the ways I've seen them do it here is they get onto, uh, I won't name the platforms from that advertising, but you can imagine there's some large international platforms for talent to go to and compete in the global market. And, it's, and, and, and actually really uh, in a very excellent way, demonstrate the digital economy in Pakistan that I think the world is going to waking up to. And I think that there is so much, I'm just very excited about the subject because it's something that is really, I think, untapped and has the potential to put Pakistan on the global map for economic exports being digital exports from talented individuals. And, and dare, I say, dare I say that the perhaps the silver lining of, of, of the horribleness of COVID was that you know, remote work became normalized. We can have a Zoom panel like this and remittances to Pakistan don't have to come from Pakistanis who are quite literally overseas. The money can come directly to Pakistanis working in Pakistan who then spend that money in the Pakistani economy. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Ambassador, uh, before I pass it ba back to uh, my colleague, Anatole, uh, do you have any final words for the international community, for the United States, uh, uh, regarding anything we've discussed today? Well, lots of things. One is that uh, the United States has been a partner, a partner of choice, and uh, this relationship has worked well in the past, and it will continue to be of mutual uh, benefit for both the countries. Second is that uh, uh, in our bilateral conversations, now the economic agenda dominates. In fact, this uh, uh, coming quarter of the year, we're busy with such issues as trade and investment and energy and climate change and uh, technology and water management. And this is, this is, this is very reassuring. The other thing that I want to say is that while the governments are forthcoming, most of the governments all around the world are forthcoming on the issue of climate change, uh, parliaments are very uh, conservative and divided. And therefore, they're the ones who um, control the purse strings. And therefore, they have to be uh, convinced about the challenge, climate challenge that we are facing all around the world. The other thing that I want to say is that as far as Pakistan-US relations are concerned, um, most of the diction harks back to the war periods. I mean, where a war on terror and earlier the uh, war against the Soviet Union at that time. So we have to uh, invent or uh, uh, rethink of new lexicon about Pakistan-US relations, which should be more organic, more broad-based, and this is being done. This year, uh, after years, uh, the US administration has publicly and privately said that they're dehyphenating their relationship with Pakistan from Afghanistan, India, and even China. Now, this is a significant development, and this is we see some manifestations of these pronouncements on the ground. This is very reassuring. Uh, I'm really touched by this uh, uh, seminar that you have hosted. And uh, uh, I'm, I was uh, really, really pleased with the remarks which have been made by Mr. Reniski. And it's a privilege to be in the company or uh, um, on the same screen as with Mr. Anatole Levin. I, I have read his books and I'm his admirer. And here we are face to face, albeit virtually. Um, thank you for that, Ambassador, and I, I want to thank yourself and, and Mr. Rineski for joining, and I'm going to pass it to uh, Anatole to close us out. Thank you, Adam, and many thanks, Ambassador, for your kind words, um, and to Mr. Rineski for, for taking part, and thank you for uh, encouraging us and also, you know, reminding us of something which, you know, I've seen in Pakistan uh, ever since I first went there, oh my God, 35 years ago, uh, which is the tremendous resilience and hardihood uh, of the Pakistani people in the face of adversity. Um, and I would like just to add my voice to that of my colleagues uh, to express both sympathy uh, for Pakistan and for the victims of this latest terrorist attack uh, and admiration uh, for Pakistan's record uh, in the fight against terrorism. Um, just to conclude with a brief advertisement, uh, our next panel will be on Tuesday, February the 14th, uh, and we will have uh, a distinguished list of experts and researchers to talk about public opinion in Ukraine uh, and um, attitudes to the war. So thank you to the participants, to Adam, thank you to the audience for participating, and we hope to see you again soon. Goodbye. <laughs>